Today's episode is the disaster equivalent of one of those trick birthday candles that just won't blow out. So, if the idea of close, intimate contact with insects, arachnids, and reptiles bothers you, today's episode will bother you a lot. Hello, and welcome to Doomsday, history's most dangerous podcast. Together, we will rediscover some of the most traumatic, bizarre, and awe-inspiring, but largely unheard of or forgotten disasters from throughout human history and around the world. On today's episode, you will hear tell of a plague of terror being cleared away by the cleansing mercy of a volcano, and people voluntarily jumping into boiling water on purpose because it was the best of all available options. This is not the podcast you play around your kids, or while eating, or even in mixed company, but... As long as you find yourself a little more historically engaged and learn something that could potentially save your life, our work is done. So with all that said, shoo the kids out of the room, put on your headphones and safety glasses, and let's begin. I hope you brought your parasol and strolling galoshes. Today we will be visiting St. Pierre, a beautiful colonial port town tucked into the quiet northwest corner of the French Caribbean island of Martinique, about halfway between Dominica and St. Lucia in the Lesser Antilles of the westward islands of the Caribbean. 120 years ago, St. Pierre was one of the largest towns in all the Caribbean, known for its lush gardens and landscaped courts that stunned visitors. Crinolined ladies and straw-hatted men strolled down cobble lanes as horse-drawn trams clip-clopped by past red-roofed masonry houses with wrought-iron balconies that ran all the way to the sea. It had the most modern amenities available, such as electricity, streetcars, local phone, and international telegraph lines. It was busy and alive, and extremely attractive. Visitors raved about its civility and charm. They called it the Paris of the Caribbean. If you were trying to find a downside to St. Pierre, it would probably be the casual racism, and the fact that it sat in the shadow of a 1,400-foot tall mountain. If you're worried the people of St. Pierre were chilly or something, I promise you that will not be a problem. Our story takes place in 1902, and back in 1902, Martinique was ruled by an ultra-conservative white supremacist party called the Beques, which roughly and unimaginatively translates into white people. The Beques held power, but because non-whites vastly outnumbered the white population, a more representative socialist party had been growing in popularity by the day. They were led by a young African lawyer named Ferdinand Clerk, and he fought for the same basic land and labor reform shared by all free people. With national elections only a week away, if Fernand Clerc won, the balance of power would have shifted in Martinique. People of color would find themselves empowered, and once word of this spread, other French colonies in the Caribbean would begin to fall like dominoes. Pearls were clutched from Fort de France all the way to actual France. The stability of the entire region was at stake, and responsibility of stamping out progress fell to the governor, Louis Moutet. I'd go into detail on his rich, weird history, but he was the voluntary head of a white supremacist political party. That's all you really need to know. Moutet needed to sway the election by any means available, including, but not limited to, election fraud, voter intimidation, unprecedented displays of stupidity, and short-sightedness. We'll come back to that. But first, let's get back to the volcano. Mount Pele had put on quite a little show back in 1792. Then it showered northern Martinique with fine ash back in 1851. But other than this and the rare minor tremors of coughs here and there, Mount Pele had been as sturdy as a rock for as long as anyone could remember. It was a volcano quietly enduring some kind of performance anxiety or a reptile dysfunction. The study of volcanology was barely in its infancy, and the collected predictive abilities of the time said that Mount Pele would probably never ever erupt ever again. If you've ever been to a science fair, you probably already know how liquid magma or melted rock makes its way up from the Earth's core. It builds up under the surface as it tries to force its way through until the surface tension gives away and boom, you've got a volcano. Back in 1902, everything we knew about volcanoes came from observing gentle beasts like Kilauea and Mauna Loa, big low sloping mounds built up by lava over time called shield volcanoes. Volcanoes like these often spew lava slow enough to walk right up to, so people believe that if Pele ever erupted, any lava would calmly make its way down the deep set gorges trailing from the summit to the shore without any muss or fuss. Pele itself was patchworked with cane fields, brightly painted homes, banana and sugar plantations, and even a rum distillery, and those gorges only carried fresh water from the summit to the sea. It was idyllic, a thing of beauty to behold. Then, the end of April came. The whole thing started just before May with a tremor. Just a little jiggler, really. People noticed steam and sulfur began wafting over the top of Mount Pele. 
Now, for everyone who's already thinking we're about to talk about a terrible volcanic tragedy, maybe we will, but the point of today's podcast is that there are things worse than volcanoes. Bizarre barely covers what we're about to discuss. Remember the Bakays? Elections were less than two weeks away, and Mutet had been so worried about making sure people of color didn't take part, it hadn't occurred to him that he might have to simultaneously fight to make sure white people stayed around long enough to vote. Making sure white people felt like everything was fine was about to become his full-time job. The Riviere Blanche carried rain and groundwater from the top of Mount Pele to the shore just north of town, but its normal traditional flow had gone haywire. One moment it overflowed its banks, other times it dried up completely, and in the background, the mountain increasingly fumed sulfurous gas. If you've never had the chance to huff sulfur, you really are missing out on a terrible experience. It's quite pungent and impossible to ignore. It was said that the smell of sulfur was so strong that horses in the street stopped and snorted, and some even dropped dead from suffocation. People wore wet handkerchiefs as masks to protect themselves from the strong fumes, but the government felt that masks would only worry people, and so they were demonized in the press. If you can imagine such a thing. Mutet dominated the news cycle, blustering endlessly about how safe St. Pierre was. He was kind of like a small-cut faith healer, and people were buying in. Worried families began leaving the countryside to seek the safety St. Pierre promised. When you picture a volcano, you probably see a mountain with a kind of any belly button depression where the peak used to be. That's called a caldera. Curiosity seekers braved the stink and climbed the mountain to see what was happening for themselves. They confirmed the stories of the sulfur's vapors and ash escaping from the top, and something completely unexpected inside the caldera. Modern science has identified more than 30 eruptions during the last 5,000 years of Mount Pele's life, and following a large eruption 3,000 years ago, the Etang Sang caldera was formed inside the volcano. Etang Sek roughly translates into dry pond, which is pretty much exactly what it had always looked like until our group of excursionists peeked over the edge. The dry pond had become anything but. Groundwater had been forced up and into it by powerful forces hiding beneath the mountain. The dry pond was now a small lake, about 180 meters or 590 feet across. They also told of the sound of a cauldron of boiling water rumbling from deep underground. Bad omens all around. Let's say right off the top that no one can predict volcanic eruptions. You could predict the date of a volcanic eruption as well as anyone else, and you've probably never even considered this as a job option before. Swarms of earthquakes often precede an eruption, but the warning they give could be months or years ahead of schedule. Earthquakes can happen without an eruption at all. Eruptions can happen without an earthquake at all. If you read chicken bones or tea leaves or can just throw a dart at a calendar, you'll have the same success rate as predicting an exact time as science. While Pele kept getting noisier and gassier, the battle for the hearts and minds of the voters continued. Mutet set up a commission to study the volcano. It was led by a school teacher of sorts. He may have been a flat earther. They were placing the date of the next eruption around 1986. But on May 5th, the sky grew dark as the sun disappeared behind what was by now a dark pillar of constant billowy smoke and the mountain quieted. Since it first announced itself, aside from the odd rumble and grunt, Pele mostly kept to itself. No real bark, no real bite, and now it appeared to be shutting down. But, just as people were starting to enjoy a moment of peace and calm, Pele barked hard. It suddenly and unexpectedly kicked things up a notch, releasing a furious torrent of ash and smoke and a deafening blast, like the firing of a cannon, which ironically woke everyone sleeping and caused everyone already awake to faint. So how loud can a volcano get? Sounds a funny thing. It's measured in decibels, but decibels are tricky to really appreciate because they work on a kind of sliding scale. 3 decibels is as quiet as the human ear can detect. 10 decibels is said to be twice that loud. But what does twice as loud really even mean? Twice as loud is the same as the difference between a dishwasher and a vacuum cleaner. The human threshold for pain is about 130 decibels. In 1883, a volcano in the Sunda Strait near Java called Krakatoa made the loudest sound ever heard in all of human history. Krakatoa burst eardrums 40 miles or 65 kilometers away. The sound traveled all the way around the world repeatedly and was clearly heard 3,000 miles or 4,800 kilometers away. If it had happened in London, England, it would have been clearly heard in eastern Canada. The closest recording was made at 180 decibels of sound at a site 100 miles or 160 kilometers away. Volcanoes are hands down the loudest thing the planet can do to itself. Even a non-eruptive explosion can be shocking enough to ruin underwear for miles. 
All eyes were on the mountain and the sky above, which now glowed orange from the caldera below. Large balls of flaming magma cut dramatic arcs across the sky. It was doing things people simply didn't understand, like the fact that it shone orange meant that whatever it had coughed up cleared a path straight from the summit through to a magma chamber, leading all the way to the Earth's molten heart. Ash and pumice continued to rain for miles. Most people would only really worry about having volcanic rocks falling on their houses, and we will come back to that, but simple ash and pumice can be just as damaging. Even a few inches can be heavy enough to crush a house or sink a boat if not shoveled clear. Birds had been found dead, killed in flight by the sheer weight of ash pulling them from the sky. Visibility had been reduced to a few meters at points. People staggered in the streets as if stricken blind, crying and praying for mercy and forgiveness. But Mutet kept a smile on his face. His skipping record message of assurance that St. Pierre was safe meant that the streets were becoming clogged with refugees from the surrounding hillsides. He was trying to keep white people in town, not drive non-whites closer to the poles. Magma deep underground melted and destroyed everything on its way to the surface. It creates tons of superheated toxic, corrosive, and asphyxiating gases as it does, and all of it looking for somewhere to go. In this case, it bursts through ground vents in the countryside, which is fine. Unless you're a plantation worker standing directly above it when it happens. The f*** is that? Let's not gloss over this point. It is the considered opinion of this podcast that there are not a lot of great ways to die of unnatural causes. And although being steamed to death doesn't sound so bad, you would be wrong. Steam burns aren't like flame burns. In less time than it takes for fire to burn skin, steam will cook the underlying layers of flesh using a little something called the latent heat of vaporization. When an ounce of steam condenses to an ounce of water on a body, it immediately releases enough heat energy to raise 10 ounces of flesh to the boiling point. The hotter the steam, the stronger the effect. Thank you, but no. Most of the workers killed that day may have been flash cooked. Governor Tet was a novice in the field of theoretical geophysics, and even without access to mathematical models or computers, he was able to pull the following purely and directly from his ass. Because science, the internal pressures affecting Pele would now be relieved, and it would re-enter its dormancy shortly. Except that's not how volcanoes work. On May 6, following another earthquake, part of the crater collapsed, releasing a torrent of scalding water, boulders, and mud, which screamed down the mountain at 60 miles or 100 kilometers an hour. This kind of volcanic mud blow is called a lahar, and this lahar flooded a sugarworks plantation and carried away everything but the chimneys, including about 150 people out to sea. Not wanting to be typecast as a place only known for its scary mountain, it unveiled its scary harbor. Telegraph operators found that the undersea cables that connected them to the outside world had gone silent, hey, and a steamer captain reported fish floating belly up in the sea. Undersea earthquakes have been powerful enough to sever the cables and kill the fish but no one was paying attention to it until the sea left. The harbor began to drain. Water retreated away from the island, revealing years worth of shipwrecks and lost cargo. But rather than rooting around for booty like pirates or trash pandas, the people of St. Pierre retreated to higher land. They were well aware of the connection between a retreating sea and the threat of a tsunami. They knew nothing about volcanoes, but they understood the fundamentals of tsunami mechanics. When water returned, it swamped the waterfront to a depth of five feet, causing damage but taking no lives. The government applauded nature for cleaning the streets and assured everyone, this is fine. Even after Mount Pele began showing signs of physical growth and bulging, plantation owners on the actual mountain supported the quiet chant for calm and helped prop the fake news thread. They didn't want their workforce evacuating and shutting down production. But not everything could just be swept out of sight under a rug. Because 1902 was Martinique's 2020, Refugees from other areas were terrified by the sight of mudslides of boiling groundwater carrying trees, boulders, and dead animals straight through the heart of St. Pierre and ran to the harbor with the obvious goal of catching anything seaworthy the hell out of there. But the harbor was as chaotic as a Black Friday sale, and boat tickets were very popular. Ship captains began leaving without their cargo, despite threats of arrest. Smaller boats were too afraid to even try navigating through the ash storm. Steamers were filled to capacity, and Mutet was livid. He responded with a two-step plan. First, a poster campaign reminding citizens that they had a civic duty to rock the boat. And second, he sent out troops to stop people from leaving. A constant pelt of tiny stone and ash fell upon the roofs and trees. All of it made domestic and wild animals desperate to flee. Catching a boat was no longer an option. But unlike humans who generally live in comfort, wildlife live under constant threat of danger. They're always on alert for predators, defending their territory and their young. Whether escaping weather or finding food, it's a busy and nervous life. People probably thought they were possessed by witches as the livestock tried to jump their fences. 
And here's where it gets really interesting. And by interesting, I mean, of course, awful. What came next must have seemed like a horror straight out of the Bible to the poor residents of St. Pierre. Fair warning, I told you there would be mention of insects, arachnids, and reptiles, and we are at this point. If this kind of thing makes you itchy, you can pretty much skip to the ending where I thank you for listening and tell you a little bit about our next episode. You have been warned. The mountain kicked into yet a higher gear, and the increase in internal volcanic and seismic activity sent every living thing still on the mountain scurrying and scrambling down its slopes. If you're picturing sloths and squirrels and monkeys, first, you may be picturing Costa Rica, and second, most of the adorable mammalian life had already fled. No, there is an unseen army of creatures hidden in the trees and underground, and these creatures had held their ground, until now. First came the ants and centipedes. You may be thinking, ants and centipedes? Yuck, but who cares? You will. There are an estimated 10 quintillion insects on Earth. That's 10 followed by 18 zeros. Taking the Earth's human population at just over 7 billion, that means that there are about 1.4 trillion insects for every person on the planet. Don't you dare touch me! Stand back! Ah! The Formi Foo, or crazy ant, is small, maybe 3 millimeters in size, and butterscotch in color, and named for their quick, unpredictable, and largely psychotic movements. That's not hyperbole. You can look it up. Their movement defies understanding by experts in the field. By now, about a billion of them, in a horrendous fluke of local geography, were funneled down the mountain and straight into St. Pierre as the volcano urged them along. Now imagine you're just a schmo, standing in a field, right in their path. It's not the bite of the crazy ant that terrorized people, although it is worth pointing out that the crazy ant would rather die than involuntarily let go of something it had already bitten. Imagine you are that schmo, standing in that field, when it looks like the ground is moving towards you. Crazy ants are known for swarming so thickly that they're often mistaken at a distance for fields of dirt, until they move. Now, imagine a rapid swarm of crazy ants racing up your feet and around your body, coursing everywhere with impossible disarray, while quietly communicating chemically with millions and millions of others to follow. Philosopher Aurel Colney said that what really upsets us about the horrifying quantities is, quote, their pulsating squirming, their cohesion into a homogeneous teeming mass, and their interminable directionless sprouting and breeding, a senseless formless surging. Yes, imagine a wall of ants so thick it could short out electrical equipment and suffocate animals under their mass. With their incredible numbers and their tiny little mouths, entire plantations were left looking like they had been devastated by fire. There were even stories of unwatched babies being eaten alive. Don't forget door number two. We have centipedes, but not just any centipedes. You know how gross and frightening a centipede can be? Like a worm with legs and teeth that climbs up your drain that time and scared you half to death, even though it was only an inch long. Mount Pele was home to Scolopendra gigantea, the giant black centipede of Quadalahopal, up to a foot long, and the legs. This isn't your typical two-bedroom, one-bath condo centipede running around on a curtain of creepy crawlies. Mm -mm. This one has 20 to 40 tough as arms that it prowls on to hunt prey. Together, the ants and centipedes poured down the scrub-covered slopes of Mount Pele and scuttled across roadways, railway tracks, people, like a living undulating blanket. The only thing that makes a giant centipede worse is a mathematically impossible number of them flooding over you. The centipedes were predatory and venomous, but they don't really bite. They're stabbers. They have two large fangs called maxillipads that they can roll up and shivvy with that double as a venom pump straight into your wound. So you're thinking, tuck your pants in your socks and you're ready to rock. Not today. Giant black centipedes are strong enough to stab through shoe leather. You would need a suit made of at least two layers of shoe leather to stand a chance. And good luck running for your life in that. And yes, they are carnivorous. Their venom wreaks havoc on the cardiovascular, respiratory, and nervous systems. A single dose of centipede venom isn't lethal to humans, although it can kill creatures 15 times its size in 30 seconds. So at a minimum, a single centipede bite is painful and usually means a trip to the hospital. But what happens after your 500th bite? I asked around, but nobody really knows, and no record of it exists in St. Pierre because of something completely unexpected coming up shortly. Now imagine you're a field worker, minding your own business, ignoring a volcano as hard as you can, when you find yourself staring at unrelated earth and horrors voltroning together before your eyes and coming your way with frightening speed, quickly overrunning and swarming over every inch of your body in a claustrophobic blanket of existential horror. These were their first victims. And now, with a taste for human blood, the swarm poured straight through the Gur and Sugar Works, flooding through open windows and filling the space. Horses, pigs, and dogs were heard screaming as the horde swarmed through barns, but no one could do anything about it. 
and next, as if on cue, came giant pit vipers and rats. You'll often hear people say snakes are more afraid of you than you are of them, and in my experience that's always been the case. Of course, I've never had a six foot long snake fly out of a tree at my face like a bolo or an animated scarf and pepper me with nibbles. The venomous pit vipers are described as irritable, fast moving, and easily excitable, which is one reason you won't find them at PetSmart. And they come with the ultimate horror monster accessory, hinged fangs. Fangs that stay folded up against the roof of the mouth until you get in their way. Then they switchblade down and either stab you where you stand or spray venom at you from six feet away. What's the bite like, you ask? The pain and swelling are described as intense. The venom acts as an anticoagulant, which leads to bleeding from the nose and gums, coughing up blood, gastrointestinal bleeding, and bloody urine. Basically, anywhere blood can fall out of you, it will. This, of course, leads to a dramatic collapse in blood pressure. But first, you get a healthy dose of bruising, oozing, blisters, numbness, mild fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, impaired consciousness, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, sepsis, and acute renal failure, just so you have something to do with the last 15 minutes of your life before necrotic cell death and decay set in. You know this is a weird story when a rat swarm numbering in the thousands is the least interesting part. The evacuation of Mount Pele itself was much better organized than the evacuation of St. Pierre, and all those people in the outlining areas who'd abandoned their houses and fled to St. Pierre were clearly regretting it by now. The rats and snakes were much faster than the first wave, and they overran St. Pierre, slithering and skittering through the streets, pouring into people's homes and barns, biting anything and everything in their agitated state. Mutet ordered his soldiers to head to the streets and shoot the serpents. They killed 50 people and over 200 animals. The snakes, not the soldiers. The soldiers couldn't hit anything. I believe snakes killed more soldiers than vice versa. What the actual f*** is that mess coming down the hill next, you ask? Imagine everything you hate about nature converging on the same place at the same time while actual hell poured from the earth behind it. Remember, 1.4 trillion insects for every person on the planet means 1.4 trillion insects for every person in St. Pierre. Did somebody ask for hordes of tropical red ants, black ants, and spiders as big as pie plates? The sting of the tropical red ants began with an intense pinching or burning pain, which would only last for a few minutes at most, which is cold comfort of course, because each sting would be replaced constantly with fresh new ones. And although the itching and burning would only get stronger over the next few days, you wouldn't have time to worry about it because this story isn't over. Those spiders though. Let me share the weird short story of their discovery. An entomologist from Harvard's University of Comparative Zoology was camped out in a Guyanese rainforest and got up for a midnight whiz. He heard something sidle up beside him and expected it to be a possum or a rat. When he turned his flashlight on it, he wasn't sure, and I'll restate he was an entomologist of comparative zoology. He didn't know what he was looking at. It took him a minute to figure out he wasn't looking at a furry puppy-sized mammal. He was looking at an enormous puppy-sized spider, and his midnight pee turned into a midnight poo. Just kidding. What he found would eventually be certified as the world's biggest spider by Guinness, the Goliath Bird Eater. And if you don't like spiders, you won't like this one. They are apex connoisseurs. Outstretched, their legs are about a foot long. And here's three things not related to its appearance that you'll also hate about it. Its feet click when it walks, like little hooves. It has tiny weaponized hairs that sound like Velcro ripping, and its fangs can reach up to one and a half inches long. Now, when it sinks those jumbos into your skin, it won't kill you. It's venomous, but it's not outright deadly. After our first 500 bites, I have no idea. Each of those bites is said to be extremely painful, like driving a nail through your hand. And the last thing about spiders? They don't bite and chew their food. They don't have stomachs designed for digesting food. They have an external digestive system. They inject stomach fluids into their victims to dissolve them from the inside out, and then slurp them back up like a warm smoothie. I'll give you a minute to take that in. A terrible plume of smoke darkened the sky, drowning out the sun, and in its shadow, only flashes of flame and lightning illuminated Pele as she burped and boomed and thundered away in the background, while a strange coalition of snakes and ants and spiders clogged the streets, causing chaos. Fire, ants, snakes, spiders, poison gas, volcanic debris, gunfire, and panic is a bad combo in a confined space. And just then, at the point in the movie where things are at their grimmest and all seems lost, hope appeared in the form of giant feral street cats. I'm not making this up. Giant feral street cats emerge from the back alleys, roused into action by all the wiggly cat toys writhing through their streets, and they got all territorial. Nobody knows why cats wiggle their bums before they pounce. Obviously, this would seem unimaginably stupid and fake if it were written this way in a movie, but it actually happened. 
giant cats showed up out of nowhere and defended the populace. They managed to kill over 100 snakes. How much do you not want to hang out with a cat that could kill a six foot snake? And what would you even name a cat like that? Let us know. By the morning of May 8, things became almost pleasant. The comedy of horror seemed to be taking the morning off. Pele's rumblings had mellowed to a more manageable snore. It still fumed and belched here and there, making tiny little squiggles on seismograph paper. But all in all, it was like it was trying not to hiccup. The skies began to clear, and even under a blanket of ash, the city appeared to glisten in the sunlight. Everything was calm. People were able to shovel off their roofs, and the feral cats were able to digest their snakes. May 8th was Ascension Day, an important Catholic holiday celebrating the bodily ascension of Jesus into heaven. Peals of church bells ripped through the town, inviting one and all to church for services. Many people sat in church praying for some kind of sanity and protection from the elements, maybe thinking of writing in a feral cat for governor. At the telegraph office in town, the evening's volcanic activity was being reported by wire to the capital in Fort de France. The last transmission ended abruptly, mid-sentence, at 7.52 a.m. All clocks stopped at 7.52 a.m. The magma beneath Pele's cone had been pushing up against the downward force of the weight of rock covering it, until it just wasn't heavy enough anymore. And at that moment, some overstrained combining force buried deep within Mount Pele finally gave way, releasing a force 40 times more powerful than a nuclear bomb. The sound would have been hard to describe. The enormity of the rock holding back the magma was reduced to pieces and ejected. Pele's triangular cone blew off in a spectacular explosion, followed by an upending roar as rocks and magma flew skyward seven miles straight up, but also sideways, and this will be important in a minute. My favorite description of the ash cloud ejecting from the volcano was dark cauliflower formations that glowed orange and red from within. Its changing shape was defined by the strobe-like effect of furious and uncontrollably rapid lightning generated by the cloud. Ash particles rubbing together would have produced powerful electric charges. Anything made of metal would have sparked, and full bolts of lightning would have flown in all directions, which only added to the horror and cacophonous sound. Ever heard of magma bombs? Any bit of goo flying out of the mountain would cool into an aerodynamic shape as they flew, but they ignite and destroy anything that they land on, like fields and homes and people. A barrage of incandescent rocks as large as houses, and some as small as pebbles flew. Even in a small blast, debris launched from a volcano can be as fast as a bullet, meaning that those pebbles could be easily lethal. As the rocks hit the ground, they exploded, like artillery, throwing off smaller red-hot shrapnel in all directions. And it's not just that people are hit by these rocks, it's that they're hit by rocks so hot that they amputate or leave cartoonish holes through whoever they touch. And then, because never say worse, the same geographic flukes that drove the tsunami of insects straight through the heart of St. Pierre was about to channel something arguably worse. If you've ever seen images of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, the eruption shot up and sideways following the path of least resistance graded by a weakening in the side of the mountain earlier. And the same thing here. The side of Mount Pele, weakened by gas vents and lahars, came apart, pointing right at St. Pierre. A great flood of burning gas, ash, and rock heated to over a thousand degrees Celsius or almost two thousand degrees Fahrenheit raced down the mountainside at inescapable speeds of 670 kilometers an hour or 420 miles per hour, channeled by high ridge lines directly into the city. It took two minutes for the cloud to cover the four miles to St. Pierre, giving the people ample time to drench their pants brown with shock and fear at the sight of its approach. Mutet had lied. St. Pierre wasn't safe and nothing was fine. The pyroclastic flow knocked over everything in its path. It incinerated every person and animal it met. It ignited every combustible thing it touched, and it didn't have a gentle touch. According to my rough math, at that speed, the pyroclastic flow had the force of a Category 10 hurricane. There is no better way to describe the event than through the eloquence of the age. And I quote, Nature's forces were cannonading with a fierceness and detonation that would have awed the bravest of human hearts. What words can depict the sound or tell of the sensation it caused to those who heard it? Language is inadequate to the task. Vain would it be to ransack the vocabularies of dead or living languages in hopes of finding adequate terms. Abject, abysmal terror. When the cloud struck, even the strongest buildings were pulverized into rubble. Thousands were buried where they stood. Those who ran were picked up and thrown as though shot by a cannon. The blast was so forceful, it stripped the clothes of nearly every person directly exposed. Massive stone statues have been blown several meters from their perches, as people were being roasted to ashes. 
hundreds threw themselves into the sea. Their scorched flesh sizzled as it hit the water, and their screams were described as weird and inhuman, like the crying of seabirds in distress. A single breath of the cloud was enough to reduce human lungs to something closer to seared prunes. The pyroclastic flow roared through the town for three full minutes. As the gases dissipated slowly, oxygen returned, and that's when everything even remotely flammable burst into flames. Before long, what remained of the town became a firestorm. Most of the victims had been killed instantly or within minutes of the disaster. Some less fortunate souls closer to the edges or fringes of the blast lived for hours or days in excruciating pain before passing. Very few people injured in the blast survived. In total, the blast devastated about 12 square miles of land. The surge was preceded by a high-pressure blast of air, and once it passed, it drew oxygen from the surrounding air so furiously to fill the vacuum, like we said, that it left those who had been close enough gasping for breath. The surge didn't stop at the water either. Nothing could stop it. It simply continued on into the harbor until it lost its energy, but not before striking, incinerating, and immediately rolling over and sinking everything in the bay. Ships in the harbor smoldered and sank. St. Pierre continued to burn for days. Even after the fires were out, visitors were driven away by the fierce heat. And even after the heat dissipated, visitors were driven away by a suffocating and sickening stench. The smell of burning bodies made many throw up overboard while still rowing ashore. Visitors returning to the island were shocked to find that everything had been replaced with rubble and ruin in all directions as far as the eye could see. The colorful expanse had been dulled and washed away. Only a pale, dirty sheen covered the landscape now. The sound of busy metropolitan life was gone. Even the birds were gone. Silence can be awful. The only thing breaking the silence was the occasional creak or crack of cooling rock. Every tree had been stripped, burned, and ripped from the ground. Every combustible surface was gone. People fully familiar with the city found it impossible to identify it by any landmarks. The 60-foot-tall lighthouse of Plaspertine was now only 9 feet tall. Inside the area of devastation, the annihilation of life and property was total. Imagine if your entire town looked like a foam block tumble pit made of stone and ash. St. Pierre was leveled. In a moment, 30,000 people were crushed, burned, or asphyxiated. Very few were identifiable. The surge had been so sudden and so intense that bodies were found on the spot where they were overtaken. They were found with an equal mix of calm and anguished contortion, which marks the speed of the disaster. There was no chance of escape. Before we explore this, I want to encourage you to check your smoke detector. And if you have a personal history with burns, burn victims, or just squeamish about the process, avoid the next minute in any way you choose. Most people killed in a fire die from smoke inhalation and asphyxiation. And according to the most vile grad student thesis in history, the next best way to die in a fire is to breathe flaming hot gas or fire, burning your lungs to a crisp and killing you very quickly. But what if you were in this situation, partially protected by a building but surrounded by intense heat and fire? Good news, bad news. First, your skin will burn, which will be excruciating, but only until your nerve endings are burned away. Depending on what you're wearing determines how quickly you'll actually burn. If you're wearing thick wool, you'll probably cook for a while. If you're wearing a synthetic fiber, you're probably going to go up like a candle. Even if you're wearing a fire suit, meaning safety gear and not some imaginary flammable three-piece garment, you'll probably pass out from heat stroke and suffer a heart attack. Most of the bodies found in St. Pierre took on a boxer's stance. This is where the heat causes muscles to contract, making the limbs coil up in old-timey boxer poses. Bodies looked like human forms clumsily carved from charcoal. There were also times where the boiling fluid and brain matter force a hole in the skull to relieve the pressure. People rarely survive pyroclastic flows. If you ever find yourself in the path of one, the best advice for surviving is to barricade yourself in an airtight building and hold your breath until the flow passes. It's not much of a plan, really, but it'll give you something to do with the last few minutes of your life. The most callous piece of advice I came across in volcano survival research is that if you find yourself horribly burned but still alive, screaming is a good way to maintain consciousness. The survivors could be counted on one hand that had had most of its fingers blown off. Sailors who had been thrown from their ships by the impact of the blast had been badly burned and clung to wreckage. Most didn't survive, dying from infection or shock before they could be found. In the village of La Carbe, shielded from the fiery cloud by a high ridgeline at the southern end of the city, there were more victims, also horribly burned. Few of these lived longer than just a few hours. The most interesting story was a completely unexpected miracle, of sorts. Louis Auguste Cyprus, who went by the name Samson, 
and later went by the name Ludger, was being held in a prison in St. Pierre for murder, or street fighting, or drinking. The sources vary widely. Whatever the case, he was being held in solitary confinement after attempting to escape in a thick stone tomb-like structure in a courtyard behind the jail. It was extremely well built, all to deprive a single person of freedom, sunlight, and air. After St. Pierre was destroyed, the only things left standing were part of a church wall that sat parallel to the blast, and this one unusually robust jail cell. When he was found several days later, he had been very badly cooked in his own private human pizza oven. Cooked, but alive. The thick-walled windowless construction of the cell and the fact that it faced away from the volcano saved his life. Stories of his crimes ranged from being drunk to fighting to straight-up murder. But with all print records of Samson's crimes turned to ash and all character witnesses likewise, he was pretty much free to go. One version of the story had him up for execution on the day of the explosion, but the mountain decided to kill everyone in St. Pierre instead. Either way, having outlived the entire judicial system of St. Pierre, his sins were pardoned, and he spent the rest of his days touring the world with the Barnum and Bailey Circus as the lone survivor of St. Pierre. You're probably wondering about the swarm and the governor. First the swarms. The following is heavily editorialized. Nowhere else have any historians described the elation anyone would have felt knowing the plague of terror had been cleared away by the cleansing mercy of the volcano. Mount Pele has to be the only volcano in history to receive this particular kind of unique praise. And Mutet? How did Mutet die? Well, like a coward, of course. It was reported that as Mutet and his cadre of commission members fled the island, their ship was swamped by overwhelming hurricane force winds of fire before capsizing. Their skin would have burst into flames as they were forced into the water, which was no real mercy because the sea had already been superheated to the boiling point by the pyroclastic flow. So, if you've been keeping score and you think drowning in boiling water while on fire is a fitting end for this jackass and his cronies, give yourself a point. But if you think that was too much for the man, remember this. First, while most people tried to flee with their families, Mutet fled with his cabinet members. He left his own wife at a hotel, which was obliterated by the eruption. Second, the lives of 30,000 people were thrown away to feed the personal ambition of an overactive busybody who didn't want to lose power to a black guy. The people of St. Pierre were killed by racism. But also fire and lava and smoke and snakes and centipedes. The biggest lesson to be gleaned here is that once in a blue moon, and this may seem incredible to hear, but every now and then, a politician will actually put their own self-interest above those of the public. These people are rarely held accountable, and their actions always end up in some kind of disaster. The idea of studying history is to help keep history in the past. The 1902 eruption of Mount Pele ranks as the deadliest volcanic disaster of the 20th century, and the third deadliest in recorded history after the 1815 eruption of Tambora and the 1883 explosion of Krakatoa. People argue that Pele killed more people directly than either of these two volcanoes, whose devastation took many additional forms, like starvation or disease and tsunamis, so it's really kind of a death toll potato potato. Two weeks after the initial eruption, an unexpected second eruption occurred, obliterating the rest of St. Pierre and killing 2,000 rescuers, engineers, and mariners, bringing supplies to the island at the time. Three months later, on August 30th, a third, less powerful eruption killed another 1,100, and this was the last time Mount Pele took a life. Today, the Institute of Earth Physics in Paris operates a monitoring station on Martinique equipped with a network of seismometers to catch any hint of volcanic or seismic activity. Many of the people of St. Pierre were never found, simply buried under layers of ash, although occasional bodies are randomly and unexpectedly excavated to this day, which makes St. Pierre an actual living graveyard. The island's cast iron cathedral bell is the centerpiece of a museum dedicated to the volcano. It is displayed, cracked and folded in half like a Dixie cup. St. Pierre never returned to the busy and extravagant life it once knew. Today is just a small, quiet fisherman's village with a few restaurants, a church, and a French pastry shop, and a volcano. So what did you take away from this episode? That blindly following a politician, even when their pronouncements seem arguably insane, is dangerous? Is it possible that one disaster can seem so horrendous that a second more destructive event can seem like a lucky break? All natural disasters are just spectacle until lives are cost. In this case, the price of blood was set by the politicians. The lives of the many were forfeit by the ambition and short-sightedness of the few in power. And for those historians who treat Mutet in a more gentle light, that's a little too close to the Hitler was good with dogs argument for our tastes. 
on balance between a life well lived against repeated decisions of leadership that doomed tens of thousands of people, our view is that justice was not served. His reputation should be in as poor condition as his corpse, which was never actually found. So, dear listeners, would you rather wear a coat of panicked insects and snakes, or run with arms outstretched into the face of a thousand-degree pyroclastic flow? You can find us on Twitter and Facebook as Doomsday Podcast, or fire us an email to doomsdaypod at gmail.com. Older episodes can be found wherever you found this one, and while you're there, please leave us a review and tell your friends. And tell your friends a five-star review helps like-minded history buffs discover the show. If you want to support the production of the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash funeralkazoo. If you're after cool episode-specific swag, you're welcome to visit evilreindeershop.com. But, if you can spare the money and had to choose, we ask you to consider making a donation to Global Medic. Global Medic is a rapid response agency of Canadian volunteers offering assistance around the world to aid in the aftermath of disasters and crises. They're often the first and sometimes the only team to get critical interventions to people in life-threatening situations. And to date, they've helped 3.6 million people across 75 different countries. You can learn more and donate at globalmedic.ca. On the next episode, welcome to Columbian Thunderdome. Every time a bone pokes through your skin, take a drink. It's the Coralea Stadium Collapse of 1980. We'll talk soon, safety goggles off, and thanks for listening.